Good morning, everybody in person in Invermere, up in Golden and online. Thank you for joining in and having, so we're going to have a church service today on Sunday, May 7th. So we'll go through the announcements um, as we normally do. Uh, this morning, I have already <laughs> given my sermon twice. Um, I was speaking at Rod Smith Merkley's service in Ontario. Um, and next Sunday, Rod is going to give the message here in church. This is one of the benefits of having Zoom, even though there's some, you know, technical glitches that we deal with too. But it, it helps Rod, Rodney out and helps us out because, of course, I'm half time. So wonderful that I'm giving the message on May 21st. And then Reverend Ross Miley is giving the message on May 28th. Did you know Broadview? So Broadview is the United Church magazine is 194 years old this year. Thanks to subscribers and donors, it is North America's oldest continuously published magazine. Thanks to a generous Broadview donor, a donation to Broadview will have double the value the month of May. Founded in 1829, wow, Broadview Magazine <clears throat> focuses on justice, ethical living, and spirituality. Uh, Broadview.org is the website. There are many links to articles available through the website. The overarching genre of articles include spirituality, justice, ethical living, culture, and a section focuses on the United Church of Canada. Subscriptions can be organized through the church. We get a church rate. Please talk with Judy Ray if you would like to be added to subscribe through the church. Judy's in church in Invermere. Do you want to just give a little wave, Judy? Yes. Hi. And Judy, <clears throat> thank you so much for being um, our, our connection now, our, our repre representative uh, to Broadview. Barbara Blysick up in Golden is the rep for Golden. And of course, Broadview uh, used to be called the Observer. Um, so <clears throat> this was kind of our, our Minute for Mission and, and PWRDF uh, announcement today, because of course, Broadview is a, an important part of being uh, aware of what's going on in the larger church. Um, and Judy, so we could really use some new subscriptions, couldn't we? And that's part of it. So if anybody would like to become a new subscriber, it's $25 a year. And you, I think you get 10 editions mailed to your home. And we, we really could use some more subscribers. So uh, give that a thought. And maybe you could send Judy a note or you could um, email Sally or I and we could let Judy know. But people need to do it sort of ASAP, don't they? So that's good. Thank you, as always, for your faithful financial support um, to the church. Um, it's harder to do it when these days pass COVID, but uh, you could send a check to John Frame. Of course, there's a, there is an offering bowl at the back too here in Invermere. Uh, and then e-transfer works in this day and age. And I know Wendy and John really appreciate when people sign up for pre-authorized remittance. So thank you for your financial support if you can. Every Friday morning, we have Fridays with Eckhart Tolle uh, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. online. We have a time of listening to talks by Eckhart and discussion. It is a meaningful and helpful spiritual time. I like to say it's probably the most spiritual, intentional spiritual thing I do in the week is that Friday morning. So please let me know if you'd like to receive a Zoom link and give it a try. Now, this is a, a quote from Eckhart, power over others is weakness disguised as strength. Uh, Friday, May 5th was Red Dress Day, National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and LGBTQ and Two-Spirit People a day we remember those lost to this critical epidemic in Canada. And uh, we're, we've been reading through the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So <clears throat> today we are going to read 
call number 56 and 57. We call upon the Prime Minister of Canada to formally respond to the report of the National Council for Reconciliation by issuing an annual State of Aboriginal Peoples report which would outline the government's plans for advancing the cause of reconciliation, professional development and training for public servants. And call number 57. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial and municipal governments to provide education to public servants on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal Crown relations. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. And just the last announcement I'll have, and isn't that good? I mean, it's really good for us to read through the the calls, uh, the 94 calls, obviously we're over halfway. And um, so I'm glad that we're doing that. Um, before I do the territorial acknowledgement, I just I want to say that uh, we hosted the Valley Voices Community Choir this weekend. They had a concert here in the church in Invermere on Friday night and then uh, a concert last night. It's a wonderful community event, and so the last couple of Sundays we've had bleachers here in the church, but now they're gone. And um, but I really want to thank uh, whoever could. I know people brought baked goodies and then fruit and vegetables and cheese and so on. So thanks to everybody for your contributions as we hosted the Valley Voices Choir. Um, I also know that there was people from the church that came to physically help do dishes and set up and that kind of stuff. Um, but especially I want to thank Wendy, uh, because Wendy was our kitchen boss. That's probably maybe not the best way to put it, Wendy, but you are, you are the one willing to make it happen. And uh, it's super, super good that you did that. So thank you so much, Wendy, for leading us that way. It's lovely to live in a time when we are more aware of where we are and, and where we've come from and our, um, that we share the land with uh, indigenous people that of course they and, and their ancestors lived where we lived and they've lived here for thousands of years. And uh, we seek to be aware of that and to live in thoughtful right relations with each other. And that's a good thing. Uh, it may seem like a small thing to come into the present moment, but we spend most of our days in our thoughts and our minds, and we don't even realize that that's where we live. So I just invite us to step out of our thinking, wherever we are, and come into the present moment, so simple yet so profound, a call to presence. Today is the fifth Sunday of Easter. The focus passage for today will be the beginning verses of John 14. The writer of this gospel has Jesus try to explain to the disciples a great mystery, that in God there are many dimensions of reality. The Greek word mon, mone is translated many rooms in the Jerusalem Bible, mansions in the King James Version, and dwelling places in the New English Bible. Also, we will consider the words, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This invites a perspective that Jesus and the religion that arose from his followers is exclusively right and all other spiritual leaders and religions are wrong. We need to thoughtfully consider this topic and we will today. Also, the verses today point toward a deep inner knowing of God as incarnated in the person of Jesus a knowing that we can also have about ourselves. 
Let's sing our first hymn. It's uh, We Are One. It's number 402 in Voices United. And you can stand or sit, whatever you'd like to do. <clears throat> We are one as we come, as we come joyful to be here in the praise on our lips. There's a sense that God is near. We are one as we sing, as we seek, we are found. as we meet together in this place. We are one as we share, as we share brokenness and fear in the touch of a hand. There's a sense that God is here. We are Thanks, everybody. Our words of wisdom today come from Marcus Borg's book, Speaking Christian. That Christianity is the only way of salvation has been familiar to Christians for centuries. For a long time, our Christian ancestors took it for granted. They lived in lands where everybody was Christian or was supposed to be. They seldom, if ever, had contact with people of other religions. Many Christians today continue to believe or think that Orthodox Christianity teaches that they are supposed to believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation, the only way to heaven. It is a major element in the preaching and teaching of fundamentalist and most conservative evangelical churches. The claim that the creator of the universe is known in only one religious tradition has become increasingly unpersuasive to many millions. In the first century, what did Christians mean when they proclaimed that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Or in the words attributed to Peter in Acts 4, there is salvation in no one else other than Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. These words testify to the experience of Jesus' followers. They had experienced salvation, liberation, deliverance, healing, and wholeness, return from exile, light in their darkness, new creation, being born again through Jesus. From this experience came the exclamation, he is the way. It is also the language of love, like the words lovers use for their beloved. When we say to our beloved, you are the most beautiful person in the world, we are not making a factual statement that everybody should agree with. 
somebody overhearing us might think the most beautiful person in the world. Attractive maybe, but not the most beautiful person in the world. But that would miss the point. This is the language of love, devotion, delight, commitment. This also is part of what it means to say Jesus is the only way. There is a way of understanding the claim of John 14 that does not involve Christian exclusivism. The key is the realization that John is the incarnational gospel. In it, Jesus incarnates, embodies, and fleshes what can be seen of God in a human life. To say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is to say what we see in Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It is not about knowing the word Jesus and believing in what is said about him that is the way. Rather, the way is what we see in his life. We see a life of loving God and loving others, a life of challenging the powers that oppress this world, a life radically centered in the God to whom he bore witness. Can one know the way, the truth, and the life apart from Jesus? For me, the answer is yes. The enduring religions of the world all include lovers of God and saints in whom one can see the way, the truth, and the life. But for those of us who are Christians, we see the way, the truth, and the life preeminently in Jesus. He is our way, our truth, our life. So this is one way that we're looking at this uh, topic and theme today. And so that's a picture of Benny the bear and Charlie the donkey. So I'm going to go over and see if Benny might come to church today. Benny the bear that is, because Benny the human is reading the scripture today. Hey, hi, Benny. I have to keep my mic ready. Yeah, that's good. I hope Sally's going to help you with that. Yeah, she already has. Oh, yeah. super. Hey, there you Hello. go. Hello. Hi. You're looking a little skinny. I don't know. Someone was using my mic. It's all changed. Oh, yeah. Well, I was part of the Valley Voices Choir. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, Sorry, I, were you saying I'm looking older? No, I think there's not a lot of berries out yet. Oh, there? yeah. yeah. Looking a little skinny. Oh. In the winter. Yeah. yeah. And, um, oh, hi. Good hi. Good to see you, Benny. We're hi. getting distracted. Oh, Brent, I have a big question for you. Yeah. The other day, I was, it was the evening, like after I was getting ready for bed almost, and I noticed everybody, everybody around where I was, all the houses, they turned off their lights at the very same time. <laughs> No, um, what happened, we call it a power outage. And, um, and so uh, there was a power outage all the way from Golden down to Cranbrook. Wow. Everybody's Everybody phoned each other and said, turn off your lights? No, <laughs> that would take a lot of coordination. Yeah. I think there was a storm. I heard maybe lightning hit a power pole and it wow. stopped the electricity from going to everybody's house. Wow. Which, I don't understand. Well, it leads me to something I want to talk about. Today. Oh, what a coincidence. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a part in the Bible that we're reading today where Jesus says, and I'm going to paraphrase, yeah. Jesus says, God dwells in me, he says, and I dwell in God. Mm -hmm. And the words that I speak and the actions that I do don't come from me. It comes from God working through me and dwelling in me and then speaking through me and acting through me. And um, wow. so, Benny, I have, a, I have a lamp right here in front yeah. of us and I'm gonna just, I'm gonna turn it on yeah. because right now there's a bulb in the lamp uh -huh. and, but there's, there's no electricity to the bulb. So I'm gonna turn the switch so the electricity goes into the bulb. Oh, light. And we lighten up. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I thought of this as using this as an example. Yeah. Like Jesus saying, I'm like a bulb. 
God is like the electricity. Ah, and, and so the, the light bulb's no good without the, well, it's, it just doesn't light up without the electricity. Well, they, they need each other. Electricity yeah. needs the bulb and the bulb needs the electricity. Ah. And, um, but it's, it's sort of like, yeah, that relationship that we are in with uh, the universal intelligence or the source of life wow. that is a part of us and we're a part of that. Huh. And, we, and we can we can give it different names. Um, but it, it, some people, uh, and, and that's the way it's recorded in our Bible, we call it Father. Uh -huh. But can be called God. Can be called universal intelligence. Can become the one life, the source yeah. of life. I like that. The big, more importantly, is that we are in touch with it. Uh -huh. um, I find it really helpful because. There's times in my days when I'm running on empty or when I'm trying to just do it my own way by my own willpower and stuff. Wow. And I often, then sometimes do I you don't really do that? I do. Ah. I don't always say the right thing. Do I you get think. grumpy? I get grumpy. Wow. That's getting personal, but yeah. Yeah. So almost if you get grumpy, you could almost go, hey, I'm feeling grumpy. I wonder yeah. if I'm aware or connected to the source yeah huh. but, you know i even had it last night i, I was emceeing at this concert and oh. at one point i thought I, i'm feeling i'm feeling like i'm a little out of sync somehow or whatever and yeah. I, there was a moment and i just had a moment to kind of be present and just open oh. myself up and quit trying uh -huh. myself and yeah and just just become a vessel and you know it it's, I could feel myself relaxing, and I could feel myself opening up. That's lovely. Yeah. So it's a really beautiful part huh. of the scripture that we're reading today. So every time I'm grumpy, I'm going to think, hey, maybe I'm not getting enough electricity or power or spirit or God or source. That's right. And every time I see a light bulb, I can think that too. Yeah. But um, I don't have a lot of them. <laughs> no. Yeah. Thank you for coming. To hey, church. yeah, sorry and, to talk uh, so much. And happy finding berries and things to eat out there. Yeah, I thanks. Guess, I guess berries eat dandelions, don't they? I do. I love dandelions, so keep growing them, everybody. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do our best. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. And happy birthday on Thursday, Brand. Oh, yeah. Thanks, yeah. 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 Thought I'd just mention it. Wonderful, even get the mic on here. All right. Um, and so grateful to have Lisa playing our music today. So our, our second hymn is Morning Has Broken, number 409 in Voices United. <clears throat> Morning has broken the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from the word sweet the rain's new Sunlit from heaven, like the first to fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet garden, sprung in completeness where God's feet pass. Ours is the sunlight. Is the morning born of the one light Eden saw play? Praise with elation, praise every.
every morning God's recreation of the new day. So beautiful. All right, so Benny the human is going to read our scripture today. Are you out there, Benny? Um, hey, Bendina, are you out there? Any sign of Bendina, Sally? Hey, Judy, do you mind coming on up? Well, Benny, if you're out there and having troubles, we're going to turn the reading over to Judy. Judy, there's some really hard words in here. Good luck with that. There's Greek words that are going to be really hard for you to say. I'll help you out. I'll have my tea, actually, while I help you out. Okay. First reading today is from Acts 7. When we last read about the early Christian community, they enjoyed the goodwill of all. This regard was short-lived. In Acts 4, we learn that Jewish leaders came to Peter and John. I'm not moving. Thank you. Annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus, there is the resurrection of the dead. The leaders ordered Peter and John to cease their witness. They did not, and the number of Jews believing that Jesus was God's Messiah continued to grow. Again, in Acts 5, there is an account of the growing tension between these two groups within the Jewish community. As the body of Christ grew, the disciples appointed elders, individuals to care for the physical needs of the members. One such individual was Stephen. In Acts 6, we learn that Stephen did great wonders and signs and spoke with wisdom and the Spirit. The temple leaders charged Stephen with blasphemy, blasphemy, showing contempt or a lack of respect for God. This charge was punishable by death. Stephen stands trial and defends his witness in a fiery sermon. As we enter the focus scripture, Stephen has stopped speaking, and the stage is set for the sentence for the charge of blasphemy. In today's passage, we learn that as Stephen faced his executioners, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus. <laughs> saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. This is the Easter message embodied. Christ reigns in glory. Those who heard this covered their ears to block out what were, to them, words of blasphemy. Note the parallel between Stephen's dying words and Jesus' dying words. Stephen entrusts his spirit to the resurrected Christ. Like Jesus, Stephen prays that his executioner's sin not be held against them. One wonders what effect these words of forgiveness may have had upon those who took up the stones to kill and upon the young man who held their coats, Saul. We shall meet Saul again in Acts 9, first in avid persecution, then in awestruck conversion, and eventually in faithful witness. From Acts 7. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, 
and Saul approved of their killing him. The Gospel reading is from John 14. You will see that the writer of the Gospel of John uses two different Greek words that are both translated in English as no, but they mean different things. The Greek word oida refers to knowing something because you have physically seen it. The Greek word gnosko refers to knowing through intimate experience the word for all mystical knowledge. For the writer of the Gospel of John, Christ is the mystical way, the road that leads to the light and to understanding. The way of salvation is the way of following Christ. This involves far more than a verbal espousal of doctrine, for essentially this way is the way of moving from a literal or a surface way of seeing to a mystical or a deeper way of seeing. It is the way of wisdom, of growing consciousness, of moral rectitude, and is the way that leads us, as any good road should, to our proper and intended spiritual destination. If it is your tradition to stand for the gospel reading, please feel free to stand. From John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know, Gnosko, the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know, Oida, where you are going. How can we know, Oida, the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know Gnosko me, you will know Oida, my father, also. From now on, you do know Gnosko, him, and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know Gnosko me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks so much, Judy. I, I saw Benny came on part way through, but I think she was probably relieved that you were doing that. But hi out there, Benny. Okay, Trig Strand has grown up in this church. I remember when we came years ago, Trig was like a 10 year old and your sister, Kiana. And, uh, and it's just delightful that Trig is going to um, sing a song in worship today. Wings await, so uh, Trig is just going to get ready, and somehow we're going to adjust the technology, and things are going to happen. Good morning. Trig. Good morning. How are we doing, everybody? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you all as well. What a production yeah. behind the, uh, behind the scenes. We've been uh, been Zoom warriors for the last little bit. Um, yeah, Brent, Brent uh, approached me on Friday after the, uh, the first night of the Valley Voices and wanted to gauge my interest in, in maybe incorporating a little bit more music and if I was willing to share any of, I don't know, songs that I enjoyed singing of other 
artists or anyway so he asked if then I when I said yes he said can you do it this Sunday <laughs> and uh, at first because I'm a perfectionist I was a little reserved I uh, didn't know if I had anything dialed down but then I uh, realized that there's a song that I wrote a few years ago that I thought would be would be pretty good um, kind of takes on different meaning for me every time I, I sing it or every month to month don't really know what the original kind of origin was behind it but uh, yeah, this is called Wings, Wings Await. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me that's on Zoom, but. Take your shoes off at the door Running for so long Your feet must be sore The wind and the rain Haven't ceased for days, but fear not, child, for your wings away, and oh, your wings they away, your wings they away for you. So cruel to you Forced you to build such great walls That no one could get through yeah, It forced you to shut out Child, your wings away, and oh, your wings stay away, your wings stay away for you. Take your shoes off at the door You don't need to worry anymore Thank you. Thank you, Brent. I did not expect that. That was good. I don't, maybe I didn't say that right. That was beautiful, Trig. When you sang for us uh, Christmas Eve a while back, you sort of sounded country and western. You do not sound country and western today. You've got variety. And you wrote that song. 
It's beautiful on the 12 string guitar. You folks at home, could you hear that okay? Beautiful, hey? Yeah. Ah. Well, this lovely sanctuary has had beautiful music Friday and Saturday and now Sunday. It's nice. Okay, so I'm hoping I'm going to move along. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, it's time for the message. I think I'm supposed to do something here. I think I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do that. Yeah, does that work? Good. Okay. I would like to talk about these verses in the Gospel of John. I think it's really important for me to be able to give you uh, the preamble, you know, so we we have a a wider understanding as we come to these verses in the Gospel of John. Um, Oral tradition. So you all know that what Jesus said and what he did had to be passed down for a few decades orally before it was written down. So that's oral tradition. And, and can you know, let's get my notes here. Can you know that in oral tradition, uh, things that were passed were, were more likely to be remembered and passed down accurately would have been short statements, short, short pithy statements, like love your enemies. You know, that, that's short and you get it. Or take the log out of your own eye before you take a sliver out of someone else's eye. A short, memorable statement. Or what could it profit a person to gain the whole world but lose their soul? But long conversations and long uh, monologues would have been much harder to be passed down orally, accurately, f- for very long. Uh, The word, you know, we could use is verbatim. When I was in seminary many years ago, you know, taking pastoral care courses, one of the things that we had to do is we would visit people either in hospitals or in homes, and we were to write everything that was said, like in an hour-long conversation, down verbatim. And so I remember visiting this family in Saskatoon, And I remember I had my notepad out in the car. So it was about an hour long visit I had, never met the people before. But I verbatim means that, like when I left, when I said goodbye to them, I went to my car and I sat there and I immediately started writing. Because they opened the door and I said, hi. And they said, hello, are you so-and-so? Yes. Would you like to come in? Yes. And you just go, you, you try to remember everything that was said for an hour. Yeah, so I I would sit in the car and do my best to write it out. I guess the purpose was, are you paying attention? Um, Anyway, the Gospel of John was written about 70 years after Jesus died. 70 years. And, And the Gospel of John particularly has these long conversations or monologues of Jesus that he wrote down. There is a good chance that those words don't go back accurately to the historical moment. There's a good chance that a lot of what John wrote, John created. It doesn't mean that it's not important because the writer of John seemed to be a very mystical, spiritual, spirit in tune person. And there's depth to the words, uh, great depth, great mystical uh, meaning to them. Um, So that's the one thing, one of the things. The second one I'd say, and we've talked about this in the last number of weeks throughout Lent, is that John, the writer of John, particularly does not want followers or spiritual people to take things literally. Remember, we talked about this. And so the story of Nicodemus coming to see Jesus and Jesus saying, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can that be? I'm an old man. How can I get back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? It's almost humorous. 
but it's a criticism of literalism. Don't take it literally. You will not understand Jesus, the spiritual wisdom, the mystical wisdom, if you're in your literal mind. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well. Well, where do I get this living water from? Or where do you get this living water from, Jesus? You don't have a bucket and the well is deep. She's taking it literally. So John, the writer of John, the message is, don't take it literally. You need to have a mystical mind to understand spiritual wisdom. And the third thing I'd say, all <clears throat> spiritual wisdom, you can almost say all wisdom, has to come to us through language, words, and concepts. And, and therefore, all language, words, and concepts will only be like a finger pointing to something bigger than themselves. There is a Buddhist saying, everything I say is like a finger pointing to the moon. Don't mistake the moon for the finger. And it's the profound wisdom there. When we're talking about spiritual matters, which are almost always formless, we have to use form, which is words and language, to talk about the formless reality. And, and always the finger will not be what it's pointing towards. And you know how it is when you say to a dog, go over there, the dog looks at your finger, right? Because the dog doesn't understand what, that it's pointing to something. And it's, it's a simple thing, but it's important not to mistake the form for what is pointing toward the formless. So, and the, the thing that's important here is if the form gets in the way for you, if you cannot see beyond it, then let it go and move on to something else that works more for you. People, many people have done that with the Bible because the Bible is a form that doesn't work for them. And they, they need to find other spiritual literature that works better for them. And, and I get that. Or in the Gospel of John can be quite difficult to read. It's, it's very mystical, symbolic, and so on. And I imagine a lot of you don't just read it when you go to bed at night, because it's hard. But even the, even the words today, when it says, in my Father's house are many rooms, that word Father may not be the word you would use. I would say the writer of John would also say, don't take it literally. I'm not talking about a, a hairy man, you know, I, that kind of stuff. Don't be literal. John is clear on that. But the other one is, don't mistake the finger for what the finger is pointing towards. So I don't really find the language of Father helpful for me. But I, so I use other words like the source, uh, the one life, the universal intelligence, higher power. Um, they're all just words, language, and concepts that point beyond themselves. We need to be able to see that. Okay, having said that, that's the preamble. I want to just talk about some of the verses. It opens up with, let not your hearts be troubled. Why is it saying that? Because people's hearts were troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, which is sort of like trust. It, it points to a profound sense of trust. There's so much to talk about here. Can't do it all today. People can live with a sense of trust, which is a different way to go through life than not. So let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Trust us or trust. Trust a power greater than yourself. In my Father's house are many... Now, if you read the King James Version, it says many mansions. It's beautiful language. In my Father's house are many mansions. I just find it a bit awkward because... You know, I envision a house small and mansions big. So maybe, maybe, maybe it could be in my father's village, there are many mansions or something like that. Or in, in other translations, in my father's house are many dwelling places or many rooms. But I like it because it's saying, don't be afraid that, that there's not going to be room for you. In God's house, in God's heart, there's a lot of space. There are a lot of rooms. There is room for you. And maybe we could add to it and say, there are different rooms. There's a room just for you. And, and if you need a different room than someone else, there's room for you. Last, well, this weekend when we had the concert 
and we had loved ones coming and so on. I was worried that there wouldn't be room and we had to get the tickets in advance and they have to come early, otherwise they're not gonna get into the sanctuary. And, and I thought, well, that's a very similar thing. Um, we're worried that there won't be enough space. And this is a very beautiful message here. There's God, in God's heart, in God's house, there is room for all. Don't be afraid. And then it says, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to pre prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. I think this speaks to how people in the early church were worried that they somehow weren't going to ever see Jesus again or be with Jesus again and so on. And there's a message that comes through to them uh, where Jesus is, uh, there you will be also. Or you just won't be alone. Uh, Jesus will be with you. It's very pastoral, can I say. Then moves on. And for me, this next verse is a transition verse. Very important. Let me read it. And you know the way. So this is Jesus speaking. And you know the way. And I'll talk about that term. The way to the place where I am going. And then it says, Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? This is symbolic language because in the early church, they called the people, the followers of Jesus, people of the way. They weren't a religion. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't an institution. It was a new way of life. I, you, I hope you're familiar that in the 12-step program that has helped millions of people, they say we are not a religion, we are a way of life. It also means they're saying it's not magic, it's not a drug, and it's not surgery, but it'll change your life if you practice this way of life. And there's a, a saying in the 12-step program, give us six weeks, and if you don't like it, we'll refund your misery. Because it's not a drug, and it's not surgery, it's not magic. You have, to, you have to practice this new way of life. And if you turn your will and your life over to a power greater than yourself, which is surrender, if you let go and surrender, if you become honest and take an inventory of yourself, if you just let go and let God, things will start to open up in ways God will do for you what you can't do for yourself. And people can begin to feel a transformation. And they can feel it in the first six weeks if they live a different way of life. And so I love the fact that the followers of Jesus called, this was called a way. It wasn't religion. It wasn't institution. It was a new way of life where people were getting better and healthier. And, and so it's teed up in this story when Thomas says, how can we know the way? And then this is the answer to that question. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Okay, so let's talk about this. As said earlier, it's a problematic verse because it sounds so exclusive. And it made sense to, I guess, millions of Christians when Muslims lived over there, and Buddhists lived over there, and Hindus lived over there, and we are just in our little, our big Christian ghetto, and we could be exclusive. Doesn't work like that so much so easily anymore. And, and yet, what do we do with it? So, here's my answers. Uh, I can understand exclusivism in various ways. I can understand how in that early Christian movement, when they are surrounded by a majority culture that is doing it in other ways, they were going, uh, we can't just say, you know, uh, there's other uh, uh, incarnations of God around in some of these other spiritual teachings. They maybe needed to say, no, Jesus is the only way. This is the only movement. And, and where my mind goes here is in Quebec, I get excluding the French language in Quebec. They live surrounded by the English world, the United States, Canada, the Maritimes. If they said, no, any language is fine, you speak any language you want, speak English, within two generations, I think there'd be very little French in Quebec. They know that, 
And they have to, in some ways, be exclusive and say, in this province, we speak French, because that if we don't, there won't be any more French. It, there's, you could say there's no moral judgment there. It's just kind of a survival thing. But the other way of exclusion that I think of is not any way is the way. If you go to a 12-step program and they say, no, carry on drinking, no, carry on thinking that you're the center of the universe, Car carry on with all your illusions and delusions and lying about yourself, you know, no, and just and be a little island, don't come to work a worker program, don't have a sponsor, no, any way is the way, I don't think they'd say that. No, live this way and you will get better. So in, in the way of Jesus, can I say it this way? It's not about, oh yeah, have a big ego. Think that you're superior to others. Think you're separate from others, that you're not like other people. Think about dominating others. Think about violence and the way of violence. And they go, no, that's not the way. That's not the way. Not any way is the way. This is the way of losing yourself, of then you're going to find yourself, of, of loving your neighbor as yourself, of realizing that you are part of something bigger than yourself, God, and let go and let God. And this is the way. So in, in that sense, I guess you could say that's exclusive. Not any way is the way. But here's, for me, the big answer that I think is important. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you add one word to that sentence, and a very small word, is, I am is the way, the truth, and the life. I am is the way. I am is a phrase that the, the writer of the Gospel of John uses so craftily as he tells the story of Jesus, because he has Jesus say seven times, um, referring to I am. So I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the vine. And of course, that term I am comes from the Exodus story, Moses at the burning bush, when Moses says, what is your name? And the, and the response back is, I am that I am. I am is, it's not a name that the Jewish people didn't want to name God. Uh, beautiful wisdom there. But I am stands for, like it's the first person singular of to be. It's like God is the ground of our being. And, and to say, when Jesus says, I am, it's pointing to this, to the godness, to the beingness, as the way to the ground of all being. And it is the way. So the way isn't living in our heads and our egos and our opinions and our beliefs and our, all our conditioning. You could say, that's not the way. I am is the way and the truth, and the life. And there is no way to the ground of all being except through beingness. If we, if we use, if we allow ourselves to bust out of, you know, the literalism of it all. And so in spirituality, we might be able to nod and go, I get that. Um, I am is the only way. Um, and this then leads us into this next segment of these verses. And I'm going to paraphrase here when Jesus says, God dwells in me and I dwell in God. And the words that I do come from God in me. And the actions that I do are, are God work, is God working through me. It's like Jesus is saying, I am a vessel. It's not about me. I'm a vessel through whom God works into this world. And then he says, and greater works will you be able to do, and I'm going to paraphrase here, when you realize this indwelling of God in you. I think it's the heart of spirituality. I think, I think it's, it's profoundly important. I think it will change who we are and the experience of life that we have 
in our lifetime, when we realize that there is a depth to us. Um, now this, you, you have to find words that are meaningful for, to you, but a deeper self, an inner presence, a grounding, a universal intelligence, who you are in your essence, if you connect there, I'm not sure why I'm pointing to my gut, but if you connect there, then in some ways you diminish and, and something greater than yourself works through you. And I've had tastes of it myself, I have. I've had tastes of it where I'm preparing a funeral for a funeral and I go, how do I just get, like, I can't seem to find the words or whatever, and I just get still and I, whatever, and all of a sudden, like, some words come to me, I, I can, and I start writing them down, and I go, oh, I don't know where that came from, and then I say them at the funeral, and people come up and they go, that was beautiful, uh, whatever, and I go, yeah, isn't that nice, I kind of feel used, I don't know where that came from, um, and then, you know, with actions, too, knowing what's the right action at the right time and acting when you're present and grounded and and so on it's like you you're not just alone like somehow life is working through you so i think there's wonderful great wisdom in these words one more thing i want to say the verses end with whatever you ask for in my name i will do for you and so in christian tradition we have this tradition of saying, we, we close our prayers with, uh, in Jesus' name we pray. And I have heard it said, why do we do this? It, what it means is, may I not be praying from my ego, from my own little scared, splintered off self, thinking that I need to have what I think I need in order for me to be okay. If I'm praying from my ego, from my little scared, selfish self, uh, don't listen to me. <laughs> I don't want that because I don't even know what I want. But when we say in Jesus' name, another way to put it is um, not from my ego, but from whatever God wants for me, for the world. There, going back to the 12 step program, the 11th step is we continue through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, however we understand God, praying only only for God's will for us and the power to carry that out. We are not praying for our will to be done, you know, pulling strings in high places. We're praying to be open, to be a vessel, whatever the higher power wants and the power to carry that out. It's a quite a different orientation to it all. But I think that that's in line with that ending part of the wisdom in these verses. Um, whatever you pray for in my name, uh, I will do for you. And, and, and that could have been explored more for sure, but uh, maybe that's enough for today. Um, but uh, lovely uh, for me to see the spiritual wisdom that's uh, in these verses. Thanks for listening. Amen. So our next hymn is Praise the Lord with the Sound of Trumpet, and it's 245 in Voices United. Praise the Lord with the sound of trumpet, praise the Lord with the harp and lute, praise the Lord with the gentle sounding flute. Praise the Lord 
with the joyful songs you sing. Praise the Lord on a weekday morning. Praise the Lord on a Sunday noon. Praise the Lord by the light of sun or moon. your praise destroy. Praise the Lord in the peace and quiet. Praise the Lord in your work or play. Praise the Lord everywhere in every way. Whew, that sounded really good. Karen, I see you. Karen, I see you unmuting yourself and thank you for leading us in prayer time today. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and peace, still our spirits that we may know your peace. Gracious God, in whom we live, move, and have our being, we thank you for the relationship that you have made possible through Jesus. In him you draw near to us, that through him we might draw near to you. We love you for your loving patience and your patient loving. Endow us with the passion and compassion, the enthusiasm and devotion, the love community with which you endowed your disciples. Gracious Lord, we all know that the way is through Jesus. We are so fortunate to be living after the time of Jesus. Many people in history lived before Jesus was born, and many still today have not heard of Jesus. Your will be done. You have been worshipped throughout history. You have made us all, love us all. We are so grateful for all you have done for us. O oh God, our lives are in your hands. Protect us all. May your light shine upon us. We pray for all people everywhere who need your comfort and healing. Today we pray for Jessica, Christopher, Helen, Deb, Cheryl, Andrea, Robin and Cliff, Ed and Barb, Jacob and Alec, Eddie, and all whom we name now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We pray for all who work for peace and reconciliation, for those who suffer as a result of war, the homeless, the captive, the refugees, the maimed and the fearful. For the leaders of nations who desire to foster understanding and goodwill, both in their own land and amongst nations. God who gives birth to the world, who gives us breath, fill us with your light and help us to usher in your reign of love, justice and peace here on earth. Tune us to the harmony of the heavens. Teach us to sing your name. Grant us wisdom, hope, and compassion for all living things, and feed us what we need each day. Free us from what binds us, as we release others from guilt and shame. Help us to focus on what is good and to do what is right. Teach us how to love. Renew our hearts, our minds, our strength, and make us whole and wholly yours. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you for your faithful leadership there, Karen. Thank you. So we close our service today with the hymn, God Who Gives to Life Its Goodness, 260 in Voices United. Oh. Uh -huh.
of its king. God who fills the earth with beauty, God who binds each friend to friend, God who names us co-creators, God who wills that chaos end, grant us now creative spirits, minds responsive to and wills your rule extending all our acts by love refined. From the United Church Service Book. May God, who clothes the lilies of the fields and feeds the birds of the sky, who leads the lambs to pasture and the deer to waterside, who multiplied loaves and fishes and changed water into wine. Lead us, feed us, and change us to reflect the glory of our Creator, to whom we offer praise and thanksgiving, now and through all eternity. Amen. <laughs>